a little bit early today because there's a shrimp boil yeah. downstairs. <laughs> and I imagine you want to go catch oh. more seminar. So I wouldn't mind catching them. Well, mammals. Um, Um, okay, so so the uh, if we look at our, our typical cladogram that we've got, this is 18. By the way, the mammals are all over the place in terms of the book. So I pay a lot of attention to which figure number I put up because some of the stuff's way back in chapter 10 and some's in chapter 22 and all over. Um, so the thing is, the synapses, remember that's the hole in the skull thing, that's all the way back in the Carboniferous period, really far back. So what we've got is a whole bunch of, of animals that we've got fossils of, but they're not really mammals, more like reptiles of some sort. But they look, they've got some features of mammals. So sometimes we call them mammal like reptiles. But you know, when I was a kid, they, they, you know, there were a few of these that they made little models of that you'd get. You know, one of them was the Demetrodon here. There was one with this Adaptosaurus or something. There was one like that to her, this one here. But anyway, I remember getting one of those sort of things. And so we've known about them a long time. <laughs> um, and, but yet, they, they really, it's a long time before we get to mammals. We're going to have the rhapsids in here, the group that are a little more uh, mammalian, and then we'll get all the way to the mammals. But the mammals, as, a, as an actual class, is during the Triassic. So the Triassic, remember, is when all the dinosaurs were running around. So that's, that's the age of the reptiles. The mammals are not... I mean, even though they evolved there and they're things we call mammals, they're little dinky guys that are just trying to not get stepped on by the dinosaurs. They're, they're not very important yet. And that doesn't really happen until we get... And maybe in the Cretaceous, things are going to start picking up in terms of, of, of some of the fossils of, of mammals. Um, but the synapses, we need to just at least uh, reintroduce because this hole in the skull is so important. Um, so you have to pull now? on the previous slide when you put Carboniferous period to the slide, you mean that this is all happening in the Carboniferous, but really? No, that's when the synapses get started. That's synapses? Yes, yeah, see synapses are right there, and that's Carboniferous. But we really don't get mammals uh, until the Triassic, and then we're really not even going to have many fossils of them until even into the Cretaceous. But you know, a lot of times I ask something like, what, "What was the first? What was the period when the first mammals showed up?" You would say the Carboniferous. Okay. Um, but the synapses are real important to talk about because we've had diapsids and anapsids. But the, the hole is a little different here. So they, it occurred real early, and what we're going to see is a hole in the skull. It's called a temporal fenestra. Temporal is a, a bone is inside of your head, and if you have a hole in it, that's a fenestra. In Spanish, fenestra means fenestration, it means a window. So it's a hole. Um, the hole that occurs here then produces this zygomatic arch, which the jaw then can, part of the, the an extension on the jaw can go up, uh, the bone here, and we get to have some really powerful uh, muscles that we can put on the jaw and, and uh, do some real damage with our jaw. And so that becomes real important. As opposed to uh, 
these other situations. Okay? So be sure to look back at that. It's in chapter 9. Um, so, so that uh, temporal opening becomes an important thing in the uh, platogram. And we see it back in the fossils of, of uh, these mammal-like reptiles. It's not as perfect as it is in, in the more modern ones, um, but we see, so we're gonna see some other changes. Um, the therapsids, I think I've mentioned those before. We're gonna get more off, get our belly off the ground, and I'll talk about how the bones do that. The masseter uh, muscle is the big muscle that goes on to the dentary. The, the dentary is the single bone, uh, jaw bone that mammals have. And so one of the things we're going to do is change the way in which the jaw articulates with the skull. And that allows us to, to, to produce uh, another structure that we're going to be able to put the masseter muscle on. We see that first in the in the more primitive extent uh, mammals, the uh, pulmonotremes. Okay. Is the focus working on right you? Is the what now? The focus? Yeah. I don't see yeah. any, see any issues. I don't see any problems. We've got a couple reports saying the focus is wrong. But listen to me. Sorry. Okay. Um, in terms of the, these guys, we're going to have a number of changes for, for the marsupials and the placental. Um, but what finds them in the platogram is some, the way in which the, the molars have some different parts to them. All right, what I, will, what I want to do, though, is go through some of the anthropomorphies for mammals, things that they have that we don't see in the reptiles. Uh, the derived characters. So hair and sweat glands. So um, chapter 20 deals with characteristics of mammals only. So it kind of goes through a bunch of them, and that's where you'll find a lot of this to read about. Uh, hair is uniquely mammalian. Um, they have these, these uh, structures that grow out in the skin. Uh, feathers, remember, were like scales. So they're, they're homologous. This is, these are new. Um, and they're, they tend to be uh, these long, slender things that can trap air, uh, do some other things. Uh, but that's mostly what they're involved with is insulation. Um, one of the things about mammals is that they are endothermic, and so having some, uh, being able to insulate their body so they can stay warm in cold weather is real important. Just as sweat glands are. So we didn't have sweat glands with birds. Birds had to thermoregulate by panting. You know, they would evaporatively cool with their, with their mouth. Um, and some mammals still do that. Dogs do that. But they also have sweat glands around their feet. Uh, so mammals have uh, sweat glands. Which one is a sweat gland? It should be here. Sir. The uh, sebaceous glands are an oily material. I guess maybe that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, what they can do is, is, is uh, when they get hot, they can, uh, the sweat gland will release water to the skin and it'll evaporate. And it, and it evaporates. When water goes from, from liquid to gas, it takes a lot of heat to do that. And so it removes that heat. So it's a very, very efficient way of cooling off. So those two characteristics allow the uh, mammals to be endothermic at a pretty high metabolism. Not as high as birds, but pretty close. So the Q10 is involved in that again. So what we have is that thermal neutral zone where, where a mammal can, can uh, thermoregulate without having to expend any extra energy. That's with the, the sweat, that's with the uh, uh, you know, changing the, just like the birds could fluff their feathers or not, these guys can do it with their hair. Um, if, if it gets uh, 
too cold, then they have to sh start shivering, and that raises the metabolic rate up. Uh, these terms are wrong, by the way. So uh, this this is a critical thermal minimum. Remember the this these temperatures. Just forget about it. Don't worry about that. But what happens when they reach the critical thermal minimum is that they're not, they're not lethal. That temperature is not lethal. Uh, it's ecologically dead, but it, but it doesn't die until some point out here. But what happens is its body temperature starts to drop. And the same thing over here, they go into hyper, hyperthermia. Uh, but that should be called a critical thermal maximum. But, but at any rate, mammals are, are very efficient doing this, maybe, maybe better than birds, at least in the cooling down part. One of the things that your book talks a little bit about in terms of endothermic is what happens as you get larger, because this is a, a pretty important thing for particularly small animals like, like a hummingbird or a shrew, because if, if you think about the surface of the skin, that's a two-dimensional structure, right? So in terms of cooling off or overheating um, either one, it's your skin that matters. But your, your body mass is a three-dimensional structure. So the surface to volume ratio is what's kind of important. And as you, a smaller animal has a greater surface area relative to its, its mass. So because of that, there are lower limits to how small an animal can be um, in terms of, of breathing, because uh, that's conventional too, but cooling off, things like that. So these little animals can heat up really fast and they can cool off really fast. So you take a shrew and put it in a cold environment, he's got to use it. A lot of energy to stay warm. You put an elephant in that same place, and he's not going to cool off. The he's not going to get cold very fast. That's why skinny little people like me get cold in the winter, and big guys come to school in, in shorts and t-shirts. It has all. It has to do with surface to volume ratio. So big animals like a polar bear, caribou, stuff like that, they can live in the north, but shrews can't. The smaller animals that live up there, things like lemmings and stuff, really have them. You know, they've got to eat a lot. So here's a lemming, which is a you know, dozen per up in the, in the Arctic. Yeah. So a lot of this uh, also has some implications for how much insulation they need to have. So the, the length of the hair, things like that, that affect them. Now, an animal like a beaver or a polar bear, when they're in the water, the water gets between the hair and destroys the insulation power. So one of the things about uh, animals, well, one of the things we'll see about whales, whales don't have very much hair because there's no point because it doesn't insulate them in, in, in the water. So instead they have blubber, which insulates them. So same thing was true with birds. If, if you're a cold water bird and you die, one of the things you want to do is insulate, you want to oil your feathers so the, so the water doesn't get to them. It's really important. They read it, read a little bit about this. It's a really interesting phenomenon um, in terms of, of size uh, relationships. Something else that is uh, derived for mammals, even if, even if doves can produce crop milk, it's not the same. Uh, it's a different material. It just is controlled in the same way. Uh, one of the things about all the mammals, including the, the uh, egg laying ones, uh, they all make milk. Now, they don't all have teats. Um, the monotremes don't. 
so this is it is a lactation is a synapomorphy by uh, the female having having uh, teach the producer not. What happens with these is they just um, they just lose. I guess there's glands, multiple glands to the skin, and it oozes out, and they can lap it up. One of the things that this implies, though, for all of the, uh, all of the mammals, is that the babies are born pretty small. They're born uh, altricial, naked, blind. Now, you might get something like a cow or a horse that's pretty much on, you know, it can get up and walk around, but that has to do with predators. If you're, if you're a, a deer, it's a good idea for your, your baby to be able to start walking and, and maybe even run pretty quickly because predators are, you know, you're not going to be able to protect them. So we talk about that being precocious, but still in a lot of ways, that cow baby is still altricial. It requires milk. It doesn't start feeding uh, on grass at all. But, but in, you know, if, if you talk about a continuum, they definitely would be more precocial than, than say, a rat puppy. A rat puppy. So there, there's some anatomy that goes along with lactation, not just the, in the females, but in the babies. Um, and it has to do with the ability to suck. Um, if if you're a lizard and you don't have a secondary palate and you try to suck up uh, water it's, I mean, or anything, it's going to go up your nose. It's going to, and, and you're going to have, well, it's going to block your nose. Not only are you going to choke, but it's going to block your nose being able to bring in air. Uh, and there's some other changes to the, to the throat and things like that, too. But what we, the big one is that bone that goes across uh, to allow air to go on down to the throat. And that's called the secondary palate. Here's the skull. And you can see the internal coenae, the openings internally, rather than uh, up on the, in the front of the mouth. So this is figure 18, uh, 11. Okay, so it's called secondary palate because the first one is, is up here. Um, and, it, and it goes back, it's bony back to kind of this zone, and then there's uh, a soft palate at that point. Um, what, what can happen then is, is you can close it off and, and then use your throat muscles to suck in some water. So you suck our milk. You suck in the milk, and then you can close the mouth or with your tongue and then uh, it won't, you can take it on down. So it's a little bit like how uh, uh, toads were breathing, the buccal pumping, uh, but it's for, for uh, swallowing milk. One of the other things that happens is that we start with, without, maybe without any teeth, but we have teeth that, that show up that are baby teeth first as as the suckling is still going on, and then those teeth will disappear or be lost, and a second set of permanent teeth will come in. So we have, uh, along with lactation, this uh, phenomenon of two sets of teeth, diphenol teeth. So you had baby teeth that you lost, and, and, and I guess, I don't know, we lose our last set, but it's a little ways on. So that's a, that, those are, uh, synaptomorphies. The brain's different. Uh, it's larger than what we saw with reptiles relative to the same body mass. But in terms of birds, um, the big difference is the cerebrum. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little bit larger, but it's going to have some characteristics that are a little different. Remember with the, with the bird, the, the big part was the optic tectum. But with mammals, the vision is important, but, but definitely not a big part of that. So it's the cortex that's, that's more important. If uh, this, this one is not in your book, but uh, 
I want to show you the difference between the cortex. So here's the bird cortex, and here's, here's the mammalian cortex. And so you can see the big difference is all this uh, convolution to it. And what the surface, the surface of the cortex, the quarter inch of it, that's what's involved in, in learning and memory, is the outside surface. So you see a screen here. It shows the, all the convolutions in the outside part. And that's where all the uh, neural connections are, and that's where learning. So the, the amount of, of uh, convolutions in the cerebrum are very different. Uh, and one of the things I also want to point out, I'm not going to ask for the test, but something that may run, you may run into it in your MCATs and stuff like that. Is that we don't we have new names for all of these things uh, in terms of of the parts of the brain. So uh, things that you might learn in terms of uh, anatomy in high school and so on are, are actually uh, uh, not not true anymore. We actually talk about uh, different parts of the cortex in in more detail rather than just the, the uh, they took, we used to talk about the neostratum and the neo, this outside part being the neocortex. Now it's got a lot of different names. The, these are the parts of the cortex that we use now. And I, I even in the anatomy classes that are taught here in college, they, they, it takes a long time to change names. Uh, they don't necessarily use those. So you'll, you'll read neo, neocortex a lot for that, that quarter inch on the outside of the cerebrum. Because this is still cerebrum in here, too, um, all the inner part. But what's important for learning is that very outside part. So it's a different kind of learning, and I'll, I'm going to spend some time talking about that a little bit later. Alveoli. You know about alveoli because uh, we look at the bird ones. Um, so in, in mammals, it, it's uh, very convoluted, much like birds, but uh, the, the flow is actually more like what we would have seen all the way back in the amphibian. It, it flows in, goes to the alveoli, and then comes back out. But it's much more convoluted. The alveoli are little grape-like structures on the end of the, of the, the bronchi. So, you, so you'll, you'll have a, a tube come down, and then you'll have all of these little uh, grape-like structures on the end of the hollow. And that's where the exchange takes place. And by having lots of those, you have lots of surface area for uh, exchanging oxygen. If we took your lungs and your body and flattened them out with bulking hammer completely, it would cover a tennis court. One? One, one your, your lungs. Hello. Okay, so if we took your lungs out, flattened them out completely, it would cover a tennis court. So that's a lot of surface area for exchange, because remember oxygen is exchanged by diffusion only, and diffusion is not necessarily the most efficient way to exchange stuff. Now, what we do manage to do to, to make it, so that's one way it's more efficient than the amphibian. It's a lot more surface area. But the other thing is we have a mechanism for moving the air in and out. Even if you have dense space in there, we can, we can push it in and out fairly rapidly and get a lot of an exchange. And that is the diaphragm. So we have a muscle underneath the thoracic cavity that, along with the ribs, pulling up and down, we can, we can put a lot of pressure on those alveoli and squeeze the air out and then, and then uh, bring the air in. So the diaphragm was one of the uh, synapomorphies that occurred specifically in the mammal group. And we have other ways to ventilate the lungs in, you know, in, in reptiles and birds and so on, but this is the particular one that, that mammals uh, evolved. The diaphragm is controlled by the uh, 
sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, the autonomic nervous system, you remember autonomic versus system. So unlike muscles that you control, you, can, you don't really control uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the breathing, I'm sorry, so the way around. They're not controlled by the autonomic because um, un unlike some things like the digestive tract and, and other things, we know we, we do control them with the uh, somatic nervous system. Somatic is the one that controls things like your arms and stuff. So you can control your breathing. Normally you don't because your uh, midbrain all of a sudden I've lost <coughs> the top of your spinal cord. Medulla oblongata. Yeah, the oblong, yeah, medulla. Medulla oblongata has uh, controls in it that send messages down in a regular basis. So you don't think about it. The medulla is uh, involved in, in things that you don't have to think about. But you can override it because it is a, uh, they are somatic nerves. So what happens is you can hold your breath or you can deep, breathe deeper by sending messages down here uh, deliberately. But the, the way the diaphragm works, it's kind of like a big parachute under your ribs. So the, between the ribs and the, and the diaphragm, you've got a box and the lungs are inside that. And so when the diaphragm contracts, it pulls down and the ribs go up and you inhale. When the diaphragm pops back, which is just kind of natural, you don't have to uh, tell it anything. You just relax and it pop back up, and that squeezes on the lung, on the lungs. And so that's how uh, ventilation takes place in animals. So the diaphragm is very important, even though you, can, you do use the ribs. <coughs> um, circul circulatory system is uh, very efficient, much like birds. Uh, it has a four-chambered heart, a, a, a pulmonary and systemic circuit that are uh, independent. Um, but as we talked about before, the, a, the left ventricle, the aorta comes out and turns to the left. So the aorta comes out and runs down to the tissues. Uh, this, the carotid comes up to your, to your brain. But they're not showing the break yes at all. But at any rate, the, the, dors, the descending aorta comes off the left. So four chambered heart and, and bird, it's, it's a pretty large heart. It's not quite as large as just the birds, but it's, it's definitely pretty, pretty decent in size. All right, so all of those things are related to efficiency, and I'll talk a little bit about that um, as we get into some of the groups. But, to me, the, the, the driving force that, that really makes these organisms uh, so efficient uh, revolves around the, the jaw. So if we go back to the synapses, this is an early synapsid. Like birds, they have a jaw that has uh, several bones in it. Uh, the uh, angular is here. The, our little quadrate, the one that enlarged in snakes, is, our, is what we connect with. The articular is still on the, on the jaw. So we have several of these bones. Now, a couple of things. That, that makes it easy to break. You can't put as much force on it. So those suture areas can break apart. But you also don't have, if you're putting muscles here to close the, the jaw, it's just going to go across there. It'll be small muscles. They're not going to be able to exert a lot of force. We uh, see it a little advanced when, the, when the, the jaw bone gets bigger on the back end, but we still have, uh, don't have really good areas for muscle connection. What happens is that when we get the, the, the synapsid um, hole to get larger to where we can put muscles underneath the zygomatic arch, then we can start to put some 
more force on this. So the, this bone here is a zygomatic arch. This is the, the temporal fenestra. And so now we can run muscles down uh, from all the way from the, from the crest of the skull all the way down. And then the next thing that we can do that makes it even better is to put, take, take the jaw and put a, a process, stick it, stick it up like that, one that goes internally to the zygomatic arch. And when it does, then you can run the muscles over from, from the top of the skull over to that process. And, and then it acts more like a fulcrum. Now that means we're going to have to have a different uh, articulation. Okay, so what we've done, we've opened up a hole so we can take muscles from the back of the skull over. And then we're going to build a, uh, even, even a better way to, to connect. And then we're going to change the articulation. So in these ones with all the different bones, the articulation was through one of the ones here in the back, the, uh, the angular bone in particular. When we take and, and build this hornoid process, then what happens is we, we can develop a, a new connection to the skull. So those figures, by the way, were in chapter 18. If you go all the way to chapter 20 and look at a, at a skull of a modern one, you see the coronoid process. It goes up inside the zygomatic arch. And what you see is the new um, articulation point that's from the dentary itself. And because we lose the, art, the, uh, the angular bone. As you're going to see, it's going to become part of your inner ear. So now we connect here, and so we can pull back on the coronoid process. And what's that do? It pulls the front of the jaw up really strong. And we're just gonna, this is our angle, and that's the point where we pull. Okay? So we, now we put all these muscles on here. We can do a lot of stuff with our jaw. Um, Along with that, new articulation is we, we add the, the differentiation of all the different kinds of teeth. Now, in reptiles, the teeth, there might be some larger ones and some smaller ones, but they're all pointy and uh, pretty much the same in terms of the shape. What we see with mammals is that the teeth are actually heterodont. And you know about incisors and molars and canines and, and, and such. And they, they, they're shaped differently. What this does for mammals is produce the opportunity to really diversify your diet. You can do lots of different things in terms of crushing, peeling, uh, gnawing, cutting, uh, all sorts of things. So, you know, we've got insectivores with sharply pointed ones, uh, things, ones that even lose them completely, like anteaters, uh, porpoise with little sharp pointy teeth for, to get fish, baleen I'll talk about, uh, walrus with flat teeth. So, so looking at the teeth is really important. Um, and we actually name them different when they have different, particularly the molars, when they have different uh, functions. So solenodont uh, are these teeth where the uh, edges of the dentine get uh, they're very sh kind of sharp. For, for cellulose is really tough to break down, so you can kind of cut it and crush it at the same time. Uh, this would be like a deer, which eats uh, leaves, things like that. If uh, if we're looking at a pig, or uh, some of them have these, these more crushing kinds of teeth that are rounded. Uh, one that, that I do want you to know are the carnasals and, and carnivores. Their, their molars and premolars uh, don't need to 
crushed cellulose, they need to cut. So what we see with them is that they're laterally compressed and they can slice cutting a piece of flesh off. Because you can't really cut with your canines. Canines are, are dead and they're for stabbing. You don't tear with that. So take a look at these. The in, uh, this shows the incisors. If you're a rodent and you're using the incisors a lot for cutting wood and stuff, putting a lot of wear and tear on it, one of the things that happens with these incisors is that they continually grow, which is a little different than most of your uh, permanent teeth. They don't grow, but incisors and rodents do. One of the things about elephants, for example, they, they don't have that ability to grow their teeth. So what happens with elephants, because they're eating uh, bamboo and stuff, it's going to really be hard on their teeth. They only erupt a few teeth at a time, so they're They'll, they'll have sets of teeth that they use up, and then the next set of tooth, teeth will come in. When they run out of molars, they die. So an old elephant without, you know, basically they can't eat anymore because they run out of molars. And I think I'll stop there. And you can go. Is the pump down?